Hello everyone. Uh, we are going to start the seventh session of the fun fundamentals of cognitive neuroscience or course with pragmatic and clinical application. Today we are going to cover memory and learning which are, as you can imagine, are really, really important functions in the brain. And we are going to discuss how memory is being formed and how memory is being processed in different parts of the brain and lots of other details about memory. So uh, the, in session seven, we are going to basically cover these seven topics, talking about basic concepts of memory, memory encoding and representation, different areas in the brain that are involved in, in memory, what is working memory and how working memory is in kind of interacting with other types of memory. Uh, we will discuss about retrieval and the process of retrieval. We'll talk about different disorders of memory and also we'll talk about something that we call memory reconsolidation or reshaping the memory. So these are the topics that we are going to, to cover today. Let's, let's start from, from this figure or this, this photo. Uh, having french fries in front of you. When you see a bowl of, of french fries ready to, to, to eat in front of you, what are the feelings that you are experiencing when you see this uh, kind of this image of french fries? Just write it down in your chat space. Okay, craving, being hungry, you can smell it, it's too oily, okay, craving, its taste, yummy, what else? Oh, you need ketchup, okay. <laughs> People are experiencing diff different, different sorts of feelings or different sort of cognitive functions that are involved. Uh, anybody who has a memory with a, with a kind of photo like this, or a memory that is being uh, activated when you see this, this kind of series of French fries, Michiel, do you want to kind of uh, talk about the memory that you have with these fries? Um, well, li living in Brussels, which is one of the capitals of, of fries, I, I think I see them a bit all over the place. And I have um, very, uh, mainly very positive uh, memories, especially when I uh, share them with my daughter and, and she gets all excited about it. So it's mainly positive uh Positive associations. Marina, what are the memories that you have with, with, with French fries? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I just have actually bad memories because yesterday um, I just have a bunch of rice and they was not so good as I expected. So I just like it, it just remind me that uh, every fries is not the same. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 then we have here. Uh, Saina, do you want to share your memories with French fries? Hello, everyone. Um, actually, mine is a simple memory. Uh, as a child, it was one of my uh, favorite dishes. So uh, I can remember my mother uh, made it for me uh, sometimes. Uh, and it makes me very happy with homemade ketchup, actually. And you have, you have clear memories of your mom making those, those fries. Okay, that is... That is interesting. There are people who have specific memories with French fries. So they can just kind of clearly, let's say, have an idea about what, what, what does it taste. But I mean, there are specific memories related to that. Let's, let's kind of have some other kind of uh, pictures. And I usually ask people in terms of how much craving you are experiencing with these pictures. But sometimes people say that we have a specific memories with these pictures, or sometimes they do not. For example, uh, things like kind of, uh, raspberries are not usual in all around the world. There are places that are not kind of very much, let's say, exposed to raspberries. So they have other types of fruits, so they, they do not use the raspberries. But they still feel that it's going to be delicious. So they have a kind of a, a feeling about that. Or things like this one. Of course, there are, let's say, kind of uh, blackberries, but there are different types of blackberries. And there are specific types of uh, black mulberries that are, I mean, they have different, different sorts of taste. And people might have memories from these, uh, these photos, or sometimes they do not have specific memories, but they still feel that they are going to, to make craving. And 
the other one, this one. There are people who might have specific memories in terms of, let's say, a specific brand of pastry uh, or, or confectionery in their, in, their, in their city, and they can say, okay, the, the chocolate cake from that specific confectionery is going to be much better compared to the others in the town. And they have a specific memories related to going there and buying those pieces. Or sometimes they just have a feeling that, okay, in general, whatever or wherever people are making these uh, brown brownies or, or chocolate cakes, they are going to be good. Okay, so we have some kind of brave people who, are, who have memories with, with chocolate cakes. Okay, it's in the story. You you have you have great memories with food. Uh, yes. Um, so I, when I was younger, and we were at the age when we didn't drink coffee, we usually went to um, pastries to eat chocolate uh, cakes with my friends. So we would feel like adults, <laughs> and we were talking about the big things of life. So I have many memories when we were eating different kinds of chocolate cakes. <laughs> And then, uh, as, I, as I told you, those memories could be specific. For example, this French fries, I, I tried that in a, in a restaurant in, in Richmond, I mean, a few, few months ago, I can say. Yeah, it was just, just right before the, the pandemic. So it was a, a, a Jewish restaurant in, in Richmond. And as you can see here, there are, we can have specific memories with those, those French fries, or there, there could be just general, general memories. And it's always a big question for those who are exposing or are being exposed to these type of kind of food-related images, that we know that these food-related images are making what we call food craving. And food craving is something that pushes people that to, towards eating. And that is, that is something that people are experiencing with being exposed to these, these photos. And even today, when we have been sharing some of these photos in the Telegram channel of, of the class, I was uh, receiving feedbacks from, from others that we are, we are experiencing the, the urge to, to go and eat those types of foods that people are sharing inside the class. So you can see that how these images could induce craving and how they can be potent in terms of inducing craving. And we know that we have, not only for, for, for food, those who are experiencing drug kind of uh, addiction or those who are, uh, the, the, those who live with, with substance use disorder, they experience what we call craving or drug craving. And it could also be Q-induced. So when they are exposed to Q-related drugs, they can have the feeling of craving for using drugs. Probably when you see these pictures, you do not have any feeling related to, to kind of using drugs. But for those who have been using drugs, those pictures could be really provocative to, to, to start to seek for drugs and, and use drugs. And you probably even do not have any sort of, any sort of memory related to these pictures. And as I told you, when we kind of compare these kind of craving-inducing compared to neutral images, we can have different activations in the brain. But the major question is, okay, if people are experiencing these uh, specific types of memories, and these specific types of memories are inducing craving, is there any chance that we can modulate those memories in a way that are not going to be inducing craving? Or changing the memories in a way that are not going to be as stimulating as they are right now? So that is, that is a, a big question. First of all, how much it is going to be important for us to have a memory of something, to have craving about that? So the first question is how memory is playing a role in having craving to something. That is the first part. And then, is there any chance that we can modulate memories to be able to control craving? And is there any chance that we can make new memories in a way that are going to be uh, helping us to control kind of eating behavior? So how memory is contributing to this story? And this is not only about, let's say, food craving. It, is, it could be related to many other aspects of different, let's say, mental health-related kind of disorders or, or 
or states. Things like post-traumatic stress disorder. We know that those who have been exposed to traumatic events, they have really strong memories that we really like to reshape those memories because when people are experiencing flashback to those memories, they have a really bad time and that is going to make lots of problems for them. And the, the worst case scenario is just those who have PTSD and also have substance use disorder, whenever they just go back to those memories, those memories would make a lot of stress for them, and then they start to use drugs. So that, 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 that combination is a really kind of nasty combination of substance use disorder and post-traumatic disorder, which is pretty much prevalent. And in those disorders, we are really interested to see how we can reshape memories. But to be able to answer that question, first of all, we need to have a better idea about what types of memory people have with these uh, kind of uh, these cues or these things that are related to, let's say, food, drug, trauma, anxiety, all those things, that, all those cues that could provoke those unwanted responses, okay? When we talk about long-term memory, we can divide long-term memory in two major groups. One, what we call declarative memories, and the other that are non-declarative memories, okay? So if I go back to those, let's say, fries, the the, the, the photo that I had from, uh, from Fry's, what type of declarative memories that we had? I mean, people were explaining some of those declarative memories that they had. Uh, Marina was explaining her own experiences in St. Petersburg, and then uh, others were discussing about uh, kind of their experiences in other countries. When we talk about those memories, we are talking about, let's say, declarative memories. Any memory that is functioning there, without a clear explanation about the type of memory that we have recorded from those images. So we will discuss about them as well. And when we talk about declarative memories, we, have, we probably have two major types. One what we call episodic memory, and the other is semantic memory. Okay, so episodic memory or, or semantic memory, these two types of memories, is one of the first distinctions between, within the declarative memory. When we talk an episodic memory, we are talking about who, where. We are talking about when. So we talk about a specific situation that we have a specific memory with. Talking about, okay, I have a specific memory of this, let's say, chocolate cake, what Adrian was mentioning about using that specific chocolate cake with my friends when we have not been able to drink coffee or, or drink alcohol and we have been discussing about some kind of important things in our life when we have been using those chocolate cakes. So these are going to be what we call episodic memories. And then when we talk about semantic memory is a memory about, it is not about who, where, when, it is about just kind of the chocolate cake is something really good. So there are about facts, not if the facts that are related to a specific person or a specific place or a specific time. We are just talking about the, the specific fact. And most of the time, it's really hard to say when we have recorded those facts. So when we talk about, okay, French fries is delicious, something like that. That is a semantic memory. And it's really hard to say when we have recorded a specific memory that French fries is delicious or French fries could be crunchy or French fries is, could be kind of salty. All those types of kind of specific facts about French fries. It's always really hard to say, to ask people, okay, when have you started to, to, to realize that chocolate cake is, is a good thing? Is it a tasted kind of product or it is it is oily, or it is going to just make me fat, or whatever, whatever you are going to think about. The specific fact that you have about, about eating. So talking about episodic memory, we are talking about who, where, when. But by semantic memory, we are talking about facts. Obviously, as you can see here, when we talk about food-related memory retrieval or food cue that could 
make a sort of memory retrieval, when we talk about this memory, it is both semantic and episodic. And if you want to change this memory, we need to think about how to change these episodic or and semantic memory. It is not just one type of memory. We are, we are discussing about different types of memory, okay? So that is one aspect of that. But meanwhile, other than, let's say, declarative memories, are we activating other types of memory? Things that we call procedural memories, things that are really motor related. So a specific procedures like just using your hand, going over and just taking the, uh, the fork that is there and just taking a piece from the cake and all the process, all the kind of the procedures that you are doing that is going to be in your memory. Or the process of, let's, let's say, make it a specific type of food. All those kind of what we call procedural memories, many of them are motor, motor related memories, or things that are related to the habits related to these memories, these are going to be important as well. So there are experiences that we know that when we see those chocolate cakes or, or fries, we know that there are some specific declarative memories, but there are specific memories that are activated in your brain that are not declarative, are not what we call, when we call declarative, then we can talk about them. They are not, they are conscious processes. But there are non-conscious memories that could get activated. And most of the time, they are there, but we do not have any sort of consciousness about them. But they are still playing a role. We have priming, we have classical conditioning, and we have other aspects. I will discuss about them in the next steps, in discussing about different, different types of memories that we are going to experience. So I will, I will kind of give you more details about them. So when we talk about, okay, I have a really bad memory about something and I really want to change that. It is not just about one type of memory. So we, are, we need to think about different types of memories. And then we are talking about different, uh, let's say, parts of the brain that are involved in these memories. When we talk about semantic and episodic memory, we are talking about medial temporal lobe brain in kind of, in the, kind of uh, the, uh, from when, when the human being is in the embryo phase. We have what we call telencephalon, which is the, what we, it is going to make the neocortex. And then we have deencephalon, which is in the kind of in the middle way. And then we have midbrain and some other parts. I'm not going to kind of discuss about those technical details. But deencephalon is about what we call thalamus and mainly hypothalamus. So these two pieces, thalamus and hypothalamus, are making what we call deencephalon or the kind of the, the part of the uh, kind of brain which is under the cortex. So that is the, the name that I really do not like to, to use very much here. But this is what we have. So this is basically the, the thalamus and hypothalamus that, does, that are making the deencephalon. But when we talk about procedural memories, we are talking about basal ganglia. We talk about the striatum, we talk about globus pallidus, we talk about those functions that are, those parts of the brain that are involved in procedural memories. And then we have priming, we'll discuss about what is priming and how priming is being processed. And then we have simple classical conditioning. And then in classical conditioning, we know that amygdala and cerebellum are involved. So we know that when we talk about memory, we have different types of memories. And we have different parts of the brain involved in these memories. And then the question is, when we talk about things like, OK, I have a really strong memories with French fries, and I want to reshape that in a way that those pictures would not make me crave very much to eat French fries. We are not talking about one type of memory. We are talking about different various types of memories that are involved. And you need to have an understanding about these memories. And it's important for you to understand that some of these memories are more conscious, so you can talk about them. But there are still some other types of memories that are not conscious, and you, but you need to be careful about them. Sometimes when they talk about a specific kind of declarative memories about, let's say, drug-related cues, they say that, okay, I really don't like them. I have really bad memories from them. I know that they are bad. So even the semantic memories are, are saying that they are bad. 
episodic memories are, are bad, but at the end, when you expose them to drug-related cues, sometimes they just go and get the drug, even with all those bad memories, because there are some other memories that we are not really aware of them, and they are there and they are doing their own role when we expose people to drug-related cues or when we kind of help those kind of memories being retrieved. So it is important for us to have understanding that there are different memories and we need to have a good understanding about these memories if we want to get into the business of reshaping memory. And business of reshaping memory is going to be a critical area for any sort of psychotropy or psychosocial or cognitive intervention that is going to work for the areas related to mood or motivation. Anything that is related to mood, anxiety, affect, and anything that is related to motivation, reward, pleasure, all those things are going to be related to, to memory. And then when we talk about memory, it is not just about, let's say, explicit, episodic, and semantic memories, or implicit, habitual, uh, or motor, or primed biases, things that we have here. We know that there are other kind of cognitive functions that play a role in, in how we use our memories. So we cannot talk about memories without talking about things like attention, because when we want to talk, kind of have something being loaded in the memory, we need to have attention. We need to have executive functions to be able to work with these aspects of memory. But in reality, the question is how these, these components are working with each other as well. So when we want to modulate craving, then modulate, let's say, memories, we need to think about all the other aspects that are going to play a role to be able to change those memories that you have. So this is kind of a, a general overview about memory and different aspects of memory that are working together. But at the end of the day, we need to be really careful in terms of how we might be able to modulate them. Okay, so that, is, that was the first part of the, the session that we have today, discussing about different types of memories and potentials, at least questions in terms of, is there any chance that we can change those memories? in a way that those memories would be functioning in a different way when we, when we talk about things like food craving, things like ang kind of anxiety being provoked by being exposed to a specific cues, or negative feelings that when we have, when we talk about the memories that we have from past.